आई वी एम Hi, welcome to a show about crypto. Where over the last few weeks we have covered many, many different concepts in the world of cryptocurrency. So, if you haven't checked that show out yet, please go back and check out all previous episodes to see how we got here. Where today we want to talk about not a specific thing so much as a philosophy that's been taking hold, and philosophy that's kind of at the root of everything that happens in the cryptocurrency sphere, and that is decentralized finance or DeFi. And because I don't understand these things, I have with me. Today, a very learned chartered accountant, Aishwarya Gupta, who also has their own YouTube channel where they talk about this stuff. So, Aishwarya, starting off plain and simple, what is DeFi, which is a word that we see very often thrown around in articles around cryptocurrency? Uh, what what is this philosophy, and what is this that we're looking at all of a sudden? See, DeFi is something where instead of believing humans, I would say we are believing the codes. So, uh, our banking and everything that is there, our financial system that is there. that is basically done today by believing on everything that has been built since past 100 200 years but now what is happening is now we are going into believing into codes why because often we will see there are a lot of things that are happening around us where, where even with a lot of laws regulations and everything they still fail now we uh, we have so much partiality there we have no lots of people coming in and saying taking favors we see a lot many corporates coming in and saying okay uh, this is this person so let's give him a loan who cares about the securities and all and later on we have seen so much bad debts and all now that is one such problem so defi is something where you are not believing on a central identity or a central entity to go out and do your business instead of that you just believing the codes or you can say smart contracts to run your business which is every, which is something which is now happening in defi okay and what are the advantages that this has over like fine you mentioned that there is a certain amount of there can be partiality when it comes to human interaction there can be lobbying there can be all those things but there can also there is a human face to correction mechanisms and regulation mechanisms as a result which is something that comes across like say for example where if i lose my money in a certain finance scam or if i lose my money in something uh in in a regulated financial situation or market where there is a point of contact human there is a way to sort of go back and plead on a humanitarian basis to in some way have those transactions reversed or to have those things done how does that work on the blockchain on a piece of computer code which in some ways is immovable so um, a great question there so basically what is happening is you're absolutely correct there is no such human uh, a humanitarian ground where we can plead and all but why do we need that see this is something is which is a by product of the mistakes that someone else is doing today if your bank let's say uh, mistakenly debits your bank account for let's say 5 lakh rupees then you're saying hey why did you do that now why to get into that phase where you are losing or where you are entering into that phase so when you talk about d5 right. uh, yeah whenever you are deploying anything whenever you are doing anything on top of a blockchain what is happening is basically you are going out and you, whatever you are doing so there is a set standard rules that is there for them so okay. and also not just the rules not just the banking there are a lot of things like for example payments and clearances today that happen so today like uh, work i have a past experience for, in a credit card company so i know like okay. the amount of taxes or the amount of cost that you incur in a in a cross border payment which is somewhere around Three to four percent, and even if you go international uh, countries like Africa, they're paying fourteen, fifteen percent just on a remittance. Think about a person who is just remitting a hundred dollars of their uh, of their weekly fee to some uh, to their family to put food on the table, and now you're paying fifteen dollars just to transmit that hundred dollars into that single thing. So that is something which is there. So that is one of the problems that centralized systems have not been able to solve. very simply because every country every company every every such banking financial institution are using their legacy softwares so that right. is again sure. one thing which is there so now now when you are transferring money on top of a blockchain what is happening is you exactly are transferring at a very cheap cost today when i use some some of the products which are there on blockchain i can transfer money within seconds cost me like almost zero and whenever i am doing that so that is one thing second is accessibility so today when you are talking about a lot of people like uh, there are uh, almost 1.7 billion people who are unbanked almost right. 1 billion people now when when you have those number of people uh, among them 80% of them do have a smartphone do have an internet but they do not have what they do not have a banking facility maybe because of the infrastructure of the country or because uh, maybe you can say that there what is happening is they they are not a good customer for the bank 
So bank is right. not going there. So these kind of people are also bereft there. And then the third part is your whenever you're talking about transparency, that is not there. And that is why we need all these, uh, you can say, uh, services and not. Now, when you've deployed something on a code, which is working, let's say you're going out and taking a loan. Sure. Now, I don't care if you're the Prime Minister of India. I don't care if you are someone as more small as earning 100 rupees per day. If you, you are taking a loan, you have to give a collateral. Okay. Now, when you've given a collateral and you're taking a loan, now, wh- where do I find a problem there? If, if this is a loan which has, which has been collateralized, if, if uh, your money falls below collateral or something like a safety ratio, you're all already diluted and your money uh, and the company makes it whole or the smart contract makes whole the money that you're taking. Simple as that. Now, when you don't have these kinds of problems uh, where you, you're going out and uh, applying for a loan, waiting for two months just to uh, complete that procedure and everything. So that is not there. Most probably 90% of these things are, uh, are the problems that we have. So when they are not there, I think the codes will handle it already. So human, uh, human uh, you can say all those rights or all those things that you need, they're not required. So question, you mentioned that you, you mentioned the traditional systems of money transfers, especially across borders, etc. using the legacy network can be very expensive, whereas this is cheap. But how does that compare to the fact that on certain transactions of certain currencies, like the gas fees are absurd? Like, yes, there are certain transactions that can happen at close to zero, but everybody knows what the gas fees like. Like my Instagram over the last few weeks has just been filled with people going, what are these gas fees? And at what point are we going to have start having a conversation about this? So is this just, so what I guess my question is, is this just an adoption issue or is this a huge problem in the protocol that needs to be addressed? So let me answer it in two form, or two things. The first Please. point is gas fees. So gas fees is something that you're paying only on Ethereum network. So okay. other networks are not actually having that kind of a high gas fees. The reason why Ethereum has that kind of a high gas fees is because it cannot write a process transaction that quickly, like a Visa or a MasterCard has the capacity to process 65,000 transactions per second, okay. while they process somewhere around 17, 1800 transactions per second. So yeah, they do not have it. Now, in order to go out and in order to process or take a priority in those in those 20 transactions per second, you usually tend to give out more. So see Ethereum, uh, I can say this gas fees are related to Ethereum. So that's like you can talk about right now, this is there, but this is a layer one. So let me, a little bit uh, explanation on that. There's sure. something called a layer one. There's something called a layer two. So layer one is something you can uh, term Ethereum as that layer one, which has given you the security, which has given you the decentralization, but is yet not able to scale. Okay. The developers are working on it. Uh, they are working on creating an Ethereum 2.0, which is going to be scalable. Which uh, And when it is going to be scalable, you, you get that transaction speed of like 100,000 transactions per second. The moment you get that, you get these fees up because now there is a lot of uh, people who are processing the transactions, but that space can take it up because it has that speed. So this right. is a problem which is there. So infrastructurally, Ethereum has this problem. Now, when you talk about other blockchains, they are not there, but uh, keeping aside other blockchains, talking about now layer twos. Now layer two, what happens is you connect these uh, layer twos to layer one. Like example is Polygon Matic, the in- Indian's biggest project, which is there. Yep. So here, yep. what you are doing is you're connecting with Polygon. And now when you're doing a transaction, so let me tell you on fact, last year I've done like 518 transactions on Polygon Matic, uh, connecting through Ethereum. I have, uh, uh, it has costed me somewhere around 16 minutes. Oh, wow. Total. That's it. So it's not something where you cannot scale, where you cannot do all those things. And there are other layer two solutions as well. There is something called Arbitrum. There's something called Optimism. So there are a lot of such solutions which are out there, which connect you to Ethereum's main chain and let you process that transaction. So even if you want to process those transactions on top of Ethereum, just a little bit of a little bit of more knowledge and you can do that. Your front end okay, is not awesome. there. And that is, some, that is something that, that is a problem. I agree to that. Uh, but slowly and steadily, most probably will have that. Now, this is the first part. The second part mm. is there are other blockchains as well where you can transfer those payments very easily. Sure. So today, if you want to transfer, let's say uh, from Ripple, Ripple uh, costs you like 0. Uh, 0.5 times 0.1 XRP to uh, transfer money. So that's like one paisa, less than a paisa to transfer money across the globe whenever you want. So that is there. There are oh, other wow. plenty of such blockchains which is which which is going out and doing that. So coming for your job, which, Visa. Coming for your job, Mastercard. <laughs> Absolutely. That is why if you see Visa and MasterCard, they are very much uh, proactive in adopting blockchains and in, in, in order to go out and process those transactions. They're all, all there. 
that's awesome. That's so so with that. So that that's a great jumping point into the next question is could you give me an example to bring this from the abstract into the specific of decentralized finance protocols that exist today or some of the most popular ones and how they sort of work. Yeah, so see uh, whenever you are trying to create this is a whole new industry it is not just finance that is creating in. So let's say the first thing that you need in any in any economy is money. So right. today if I I'll, I'll talk more about Ethereum majorly because Ethereum is very much known and widely those projects yes. are known. So that is uh, that is my reason to pick up Ethereum. And yeah, I also love Ethereum as well. So that is there. I would but, never uh, have guessed so, from the little poster above you <laughs> in the background there. <laughs> so is there? Yeah. So basically, when you're talking about Ethereum, so the first thing is you need money. Now, money is something today you can generate out of thin air. Basically, out of thin air. Today mm-hmm. we are seeing that Evergrande uh, fallout. And yes, in last two weeks, the Chinese government has pulled in like 19 billion and 120 billion yuan into this into the economy. Yeah. Just printed it and given it out. But yep. here, when you're talking about those decentralized finance, you are actually collateralizing any any such stable coin or any such currency that you're bringing. So the example right. is that now once you have brought in that uh, collateralized uh, or backed uh, stable coin, which means that now what is happening is anything that is there in circulation is collateralized. There is a backing to it. So if okay. tomorrow you want to redeem it, you can very well go out and redeem it, which is not true in today's economies anywhere in the world. Second is, let's say I have money now. The second thing is, I want to do business. When I want to do business, the second thing that you will do is, you you maybe would want to take out a loan because mm-hmm. you need money for maybe doing a business. Or maybe you have a lot of money and you want to just deposit it in your bank account to earn a return. But that is something which is, you can say, lending and borrowing. So here right. you can uh, take the example of Compound. You can take the example of Aave. So the, or you can take the example of Sushi Swap. Uh, all these places, but Aave and Compound are like the blue chips. Where Aave and Compound, what is happening is they have these lending and borrowing protocols. All you have to do is, like, even if you take, need the money at two a.m. at night, all you have to do is you need a wallet, which is you can say take example as MetaMask, mm-hmm. in, uh, and have a little collateral there. Any crypto uh, which they support, majorly they support all the blue chip cryptos which are there. You give them as a collateral and withdraw money as a loan. That is it. Right. So that quickly, within two minutes, you have the money in form of, let's say, a stable coin, which you can maybe deposit in your uh, exchanges, which are there, centralized exchanges, and withdraw it from your bank account. It's as easy as that. So that so you is take, the you take, Sorry, coin. just so for my understanding yes. is, you take what coins you actually already have, and you put them in there as collateral, and then you borrow based off of that. Correct. Exactly. Okay. And another another awesome thing about this is basically your rates are uh, monitored twenty four by seven. So if the if the, the requirement for the for a particular crypto rises, the rate rises. But if the if that is required, that is lessening out, your rates also reduce. In banks, it's three months you have to wait in order to get that revision out. Right. Okay. So these are essentially looking at dynamic interest rates. Correct. With, but that could go either way, right? Like at least what that three months buys you is stability one way or another, right? You're protected against any sudden spikes and you're protected against sudden troughs also. Uh, what happens in this system? Because the, the, there's one thing I've learned over the last few episodes of doing this and over the last few weeks of just following the crypto market and the last year of following the crypto market is that this is a terrifyingly volatile system. So on the one hand, yes, three months is... Horrible, but also there's a certain inbuilt stability that comes with that. So how do you protect against that sort of volatility in a decentralized finance network? So when you talk about that, what happens is, let's say when you're talking about stable coins only. So yeah, if the demand is high, the rates will increase, the rate will go up to 11, 12, sometimes 16% uh, just to borrow that money. But if you if you look at the normal finance, it's already 11 to 14% all the time. Almost Fair. all the time, 10, to, 10 to 14%. There you are getting like right now, if you if you just try right now, go and check the price. It's somewhere around 7%. It, it can go up to as low as 1%. That is that being said. Now what is happening is it's going towards institutional adoption. The only thing that we require is institutional adoption. Now when institutions dump in money here, see, if you if you have money in some parts of uh, uh, Europe, you're, you're, you're basically earning negative rate of interest. If sure, you yeah. are in US, you're basic, basically earning 0% rate of interest. But there are various uh, products that are coming in, even with compound only, I think. Uh, what, where, what they're saying is you don't even give us uh, uh, or you don't even take exposure in any crypto 
and you just lend us your US dollars. What we will do is we will convert them into a stable coin and we will put, lend it out in our platform in a KYC form. And then what you have is you have that abundance in the market where you have so much stable coins and so much uh, supply that your race would never go that high. So this is again ah, how you tackle okay. it very soon. All right, some fantastic conversations happening around decentralized finance here on a show about crypto. We need to take a short break just so you can go Google some of these terms and we can get a sip of water. We'll see you right back in a couple of seconds. Security on a computer is like a layered cake. But no matter how secure each layer is, attackers and hackers are going to work tirelessly to find a vulnerability and exploit it. These cyber attacks can sneak into systems unnoticed, eventually gaining access to all the programs and files on your computer. Luckily, with Intel vPro, all of this is avoidable. Intel vPro has the Intel Hardware Shield, which adds protection to every layer of the computer system with three groups of security capabilities. Advanced Threat Protection, which helps quickly detect and remediate the latest ransomware and crypto mining attacks on the system. Below the OS security, which helps identify unauthorized changes to hardware and firmware, and application and data protection, which helps prevent memory corruption and malware injections. So secure your organization's productivity with hardware-based security only with Intel vPro. Visit www.intel.in slash IT heroes to know more. Intel vPro, built for business. And we're back from our break on a show about crypto. I am in conversation with Aishwarya Gupta about decentralized finance. So, on the one hand, there is just the fact that you don't require a human arbiter who is inherently biased, whether you like it or not. That right there is one advantage of DeFi platforms. What are other ways that this protocol disrupts the traditional finance system or facets of the traditional finance system that we take for granted today? Like the one thing that you mentioned was, yeah, we take for granted that rates will change once every three months versus rates change dynamically. What are other ways this fundamentally changes the way we engage with the conventional financial system. What, what, is, what is DeFi coming out here and saying that here's four or five things that make me remarkably different from traditional systems? Sure. So first, like I already told you, is uh, lending and borrowing. So second is yep. the paperwork that you're actually doing. I mean, imagine. So I, I, I recently acquired a property. It took me around one and a half months just to process those paperwork, get yep. myself registered, doing all those stuff, and a lot more costly. Now here, you are removing all those costs. So that is the first thing. Second is, uh, once you are there, accessibility becomes so easy. And like, not just lending and borrowing, the next thing that comes in here is, let's say, uh, exchanges. So today, if you remember the three, four months back, there, there was a very, very bad crash that happened in the market. All those centralized exchanges. I do remember, no matter, yeah, I do, I do remember, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> so all those places or all those you can say all exactly those centralized exchanges no matter if it was Coinbase, Binance, whatever they all stumbled down they were not working there were a lot of lags, glitches now talking about another exchange which was there on decentralized exchange which was Uniswap Uniswap yes. on that particular day so on that day I, I actually handled over $150 million um, oh wow that much amount on that so that system was flawless. Uniswap on that day processed over $6 billion worth of transaction. There was not a single glitch. The system was not down. If you wanted to process, yes, the gas fees was high. But for someone who is transacting 500 million or 100 million or 500,000 transaction, even if I had to pay like $400 as a gas fee and the system was still running, that is a very big thing which no centralized system can guarantee today. I mean, talk okay. about any bank and that happens. You cannot guarantee that. But these systems were guaranteeing me that, that you can process your transaction. It does not matter how much volume you are getting. Newer systems, they don't, they, are, they do not have that much capacity. They do, to, uh, do tend to fail, but it, that is why I love Ethereum. It has established itself, uh, itself as a brand and it has established its systems so robustly that it can handle that. So that is again, thing. another one where you, you talk, of, talk of those exchanges where they are working uh, and you can do that in a decentralized manner. So that's another thing. Next is derivative trading. So derivative trading, again, there is a huge volume of derivative trading. Giving you a very simple example. We talk about elections. We talk about that media house is going to say that we, this is winning the election and that is winning the election. Mm -hmm. The US elections, who, who, which media house who came out and said that uh, Trump is not going to win? No one was because they were afraid. They, or maybe if they, they did not have the data or maybe the people were supplying the wrong data. Now put money behind this. What you do is there was there was a uh, there was a derivative product on FTX exchange which said uh, if you think Trump will win bid on it if you want if you think uh, uh, Bidin will win uh, bid on it 
Now, if you are putting your money, you don't care whether uh, who uh, what people will think about you. You put your money where your mouth is, where you feel that you're gonna uh, this person's yeah. gonna win because that is gonna make you money. Mm-hmm. So similarly, at that point of time, there sixty nine percent of the people in, on that exchange said that Vidyan is gonna win, while no media house in the whole country was saying Vidyan is gonna win. That is where you put your mouth and your money. So again, predictive markets, uh, derivative markets, something which is very well connected and which is bringing you all the correct data. So that is again a market. Then you talk about, uh, uh, let's say, fund management. So today we have those passive fund managements. Passive fund management is basically where you try to mimic or copy an existing uh, uh, index, which is there, like S&P 500, Nifty 50, or something like that. We try to mimic them. Now in DeFi also, what you can do is you can devise your strategy. Let's say you are someone who knows DeFi very well, and you right. know what is going, which is which is going to be very big, or which project is going to be very big, and something like that. So here, what you do is you basically go out and you can create those models, and not only you profit from them, you can also give out these fund strategies in public and charge a fee. Now, another problem that this solves here is basically the money that is there. Money is going to the smart contract, and money is not going to the person who is managing your fund. So he can never run away right. with your money. That is not true in your passive fund management anywhere in the world. There are so many scams that people run away with your money and everything. So again, right. another thing that is there. Uh, more talking more about it. There is insurance. So insurance is something today uh, we have some. We have nothing called a parametric insurance as such. Now parametric insurance in very simple terms is basically let's say you have a shop, and in your shop you have an inventory. So not your your inventory will not be exactly the same throughout the year. If you if it's like a festival like a Diwali or a Holi, you might have a better inventory because you think that the sales <coughs> are going to be up. But maybe some other days your say your inventory would not be that high. Now today, what happens is you you if if let's say that inventory catches fire, you call in an assessor, and when you call in an assessor, what you do is basically you can bribe him, tell him that hey, just put in like a little bit more and let's let's divide the profits and everything. But here, what you do is again you put all these things on quote. Now, when you put all these things on quote or you put it all those things on algorithms, there is something mm-hmm. called parametric insurance that is being developed here. Now here, what happens is we will take up uh, take all your data which is there in your previous financial years. We will give, run an algorithm on it. We will predict that on this particular, this is something that you want to have. So this right. is something if, you, if that is we have predicted. I don't need an assessor anymore. What I will do is I will simply say based on your past, for past three years, four years, or five years of record, this is something that is there. And now it's coded. I am not coming in and fighting with you that this is this was more, that was more. But here that is one another thing. Apart from that, there are decentralized insurance protocols where what you do is you uh, take that insurance. Let's say when you are dabbling into DeFi. Uh, there is one threat you can lose your funds and that's mm-hmm. very very uh, very normal thing to happen today because these are developing and these kinds of things are going to happen now you take you go out and take your insurances once let's say you took out an insurance on your binance account saying that if anything happens to my binance account this is the amount i want to be paid in right. the moment let's say the binance goes down or it is had you can simply go and submit your request in these platforms saying that this is there now because all these have digital dust or digital footprints out there you don't nobody can deny you all those things and then when you bring in all those on decentralized if you are some uh, and you can become an assessor here you can take an insurance also or you can become an assessor here as well now when you become an assessor here what happens is let's say if you are someone who is uh, who is contributing towards the positive or uh, the correct uh, you can say the articulation of your claims then you get rewarded for that and if you are someone right. who is not doing that you are punished now here it's not one person. Here you have thousands of people doing it. So chances that you can collude with those thousands of people, it's impossible. But ta- sure. chances to collude with one person, hundred percent. That's something which is there. I I believe it. So a last thing, and the last thing is like another thing that is there is payments. So yeah, Bitcoin is there. Cryptocurrencies are there to make those payments. But what if let's say you work with someone and let's say you get paid by the minute, just like streaming music, I stream money with you. If you're working, if, if we are going for a 30 minute paid up session, what I do is you don't give me the money because most probably we are meeting for the first time. So you right. do not uh, trust me whether I'm going to give you that service or not. And I don't trust you whether after taking the service, you're going to pay me. Now, what you do is you put that money or you put that faith on a smart contract. Uh, mm-hmm. And what you do is you start a clock. And let's say if I end my services within 18 minutes, I get paid for those 18 minutes. And if I complete my 30 minute service, I get paid for the 30 minutes. So these okay. are the things I think DeFi is building. 
And these are the financial products which majorly are one. You said four, five. So I've given you like six of them. You have. Those so are those are great examples of like what what DeFi can do, and that's great. Um, which brings me to my sort of next question: Is how does all of this fit in with? And I guess this is so. Actually, two questions. I take one at a time. One is um, in any financial system, uh, there, there's a cost to running the system, and there's somebody that wants to make money off of that system. So, what are the different ways that these DeFi systems say also have yields and profits for the people who are putting time into running them? Aside from just the actual transaction fees that are on the network, is there anything else as well that also guarantees yield? Like today, your centralized finance networks are obviously taking your money, and then there are yields for them. Also, it's not purely altruistic. So, how does that work in a DeFi setup? So on DeFi, it's even better. So uh, like again, like I told you, your uh, rates and all they change like six months, five months that way on on your deposit. Now when you deposit your cryptocurrencies in these centralized systems, maybe if you do not want to get into those uh, price volatilities, you can uh, simply invest in your stable coins. And uh, interest rate that you get will always I have always seen them way more better and way more than your saving bank accounts. They can again range from it depends upon the demand. Like I told you, if the demand for that particular cryptocurrency that you're trying to lend is high, you can get uh, interest rates up to 20-25% even. But uh, if, it, if it's something which is normal, so you get 5-6% uh, still. Uh, so still you're getting all that return which is there. So if you're uh, depositing your money, like most of my crypto which I have, which is there for the long term, I've mostly lent it out or I've given out to some other protocols and it's earning a yield. Most of my cryptocurrency, I would say 80% of my cryptocurrency is earning a yield. And here, uh, again, what I can say is like, where do you get it? So if you don't know, uh, you, you you can search all these protocols. Like I, I already gave you gave you on Ethereum. So Compound is there, Dai, Dai Maker DAO is there. So that is, mm-hmm. or you can say Aave is there. Uh, where you can get these things, I would not want you to lend out or you uh, to get into those liquidity mining right now because that becomes a little bit tricky. Where you have to understand a little bit of the nuances that are there because there you are earning fees, but you are also losing some part of it of your cryptocurrency as well, which is some, somewhere known as uh, impermanent losses. So that is something that uh, for a newbie I would not say, but yeah, returns are still there. And whenever a new cryptocurrency or something co- comes in. What happens is you have to go and circulate your cryptocurrency. The best way to circulate your cryptocurrency is through these uh, these protocols only. Sometimes you'll get even a thousand percent, fifteen hundred percent returns, but then your risk is also like a hundred percent, ninety five percent risk. So don't get into something just because it's a it's a very high uh, re- revenue rewarding program. But if you go for something which is more secure or which is where you can go out and say, yeah, this is correct, that is happening, uh, I'm getting a stable return. So that they they are there. Apart from that, there are other projects as well, which give you a stable return as well. So Aave gives you a stable return as well. So you can choose from a variable and a stable one. Right. So stable okay. one is also there. So for those people who feel <laughs> like, okay, I don't want to get into these fluctuations and everything. I want a stable return. So go to Aave. You still have that. Uh, you can still do that. And you can connect with your, uh, uh, I, uh, like I told you, Polygon uh, network. Yeah. You can still do those transactions for pennies and it's still going on. My biggest takeaway from that answer, which by the way, very detailed and thank you, was that uh, to anybody who's listening, if you're a newbie, don't get excited and run straight in being like, all right, I'm getting into DeFi and I'm running into it. Make sure that you either have done some of your research or you have a friend like Aishwarya who can contextualize it heavily for you. Otherwise, uh, you could find yourself in trouble because all said and done, this is, while this is great and while this is utopian and all of those things, the fact is we are very much in that stage of its life cycle where this shit is complicated for anybody who it, it it it's the analogy i have is this is like the early days of the internet or the early days of computing before we designed ui and ux that anybody could sit down in front of this is when you still physically had to play with the actual code and commands to actually get anything done and that's what the defi space to me feels like or in general this entire crypto space feels to me like right now outside of the actual trading of it the second you try to get into involved in transacting on a micro level, it suddenly feels like you'd better be way more informed than you have been before. Which kind of brings me to my I, well, two final questions. Uh, this one is okay. the important one. How does how does decentralized finance stack up with, or rather in this case, integrate with or threaten current tax regimes and the way money is currently taxed, mapped, and 
recorded essentially for want of a better word by the world's financial systems yes i know blockchains have all these sort of transactions on record etc but given that you're now looking at a network where theoretically anybody could be anonymously and we see this right like we see whales moving money all the time uh how do you how does this integrate with the world's current taxation network and if it doesn't what's the future for the taxation of this stuff okay so i will start with giving you one example telling you that governments cannot shut it uh, because that is how i will go to my next question uh, next sure. answer so in 2018 uh, there is something like i told you uniswap where you can swap your tokens and it's a decentralized uh, exchange where mm-hmm. you can buy and sell your cryptocurrency so in 2018 there were because uh, the uni labs is registered in us so they had a fallout or whatever happened it never became public but uh, faft rules uh, said that uh, in eight countries you cannot transfer money from us okay now what happened because of this particular reason uniswap because it was in us they had to comply with this rule and overnight they uploaded a changed code of their website which was connecting to the smart contract now in the morning when people let's say went ahead and they were trying to transfer into those in constituencies they were not able to okay now the best part about decentralized finance is all your codes are something which are publicly hosted you do not have your mm-hmm. codes which are private uh, which is uh, something where you do not have any knowledge about it but they are publicly hosted so anyone can see those codes so within 4 hours i think the moment this code was uploaded within 4 hours other coders downloaded the software checked what exactly is the upgraded version that is updated and they realized that there is something that these eight websites or these eight countries have been stopped from transacting from the front end not the right. smart contract you cannot do that with the smart contract but from right. the front end who is interacting with the smart contract Sure. Now, being done this, uh, uh, government might think that yes, we have achieved that victory. Now, within uh, again, within the next 12 hours, what happened was there is something called IPFS. Uh, again, I'm throwing a jargon, but IPFS is something like torrent. So, in torrent, what happens is there is no central server. You and my, uh, me, are the hosts where we are saving the data. Similarly, right. is IPFS a cloud-based uh, file storing system? On okay. Which? Now, here, what happened? Uh, these people they created. dummy uh, dummy websites uh, on these ipfs servers the problem with ipfs servers is you cannot block them because it's not just one place you know, multiple places right. from where sure. your website is being hosted so within 12 hours there were hundreds of such websites that came into picture and that connected the back end of that smart contract again with that uniswap contract now this within 12, within like 4 plus 12 16 hours and this whole thing which was created by the government that went down and within 16 hours government realized that this is something you cannot stop now with with this thing in your mind how do you tax it the taxation system is something which has to be rethought the biggest reason is because here if we are completely going into a complete decentralization which by my thought process or by my articulation is not going to happen there is going to be a mix which where most probably the front end is going to be or the custody and everything might be still there with those centralized uh, networks but those decentralized networks provide the technology and the uh, know how whatever they have developed or use those things that they have developed in order to integrate to make this whole ecosystem a better place now if this is something which is happening then you still have those trackabilities you still have those kyc is done with the people and everything sure. once we have those that kind of an adoption till the point we reach there there will be uh, there will be these kinds of problems where you have to literally Use those digital footprints uh, and uh, that digital dust which is there in order to track IP. So there are various companies like Chain Analysis and uh, other such companies where what they do is they basically track all the things that are happening, and right. then what they do is based on that data they co- co- work with the governments in order to bust some scams that are going on or stop some illeg- uh, illegitimate transactions that are happening. So there, what will happen is maybe that uh, ecosystem gets created where. these once the whole network gets mapped into these firms you will be able to get a way in which you will be able to track the money that is happening and then most probably uh, today what we do is we tax uh, the individual who is receiving the income after he has received it so let's mm-hmm. say i've got my salary and everything at the year end i will uh, uh, submit my taxes there what could happen is maybe you can start taxation from the point of origin when a transaction is originating at that point only deduct a tax and don't care about where the fund is going so that could be another way so but crypto mein bhi tds aa gaya basically crypto mein bhi tds aa gaya 
<laughs> you can say that. I mean, this is something which is not thought about. I don't think anyone is even working on that because Fair. right now the governments are still not thinking that this is going to happen. But it has ah. become too big that now you stop it. You cannot stop it. That is why I gave you the example. The government wants to stop it. That has gone. So, so one more question. And now it's a little philosophical question. Okay, I mean, it's not a technical question, which is that. great ideal right decentralized finance um, money belongs to everybody there's no central arbiter etc but just given the nature of money itself given what we have seen and what we do know about money is will there ever be such a thing as truly decentralized finance where power belongs to everybody because like i said we are already even within the crypto space seeing the emergence of whales or the emergence of institutions that have well for want of a better word so much gravity to their actual crypto holdings that at the end of the day they have started to shift things themselves so what happens when you have a defi systems equivalent of a george soros who literally at some point has enough money to beat a central bank if he needs to uh, so i guess this is this is a philosophical question that i don't know if you'll have a definitive answer for but is it on some level I utopian mean, to think that money will truly be decentralized i mean you're absolutely right i agree on you with on this point where money cannot never be decentralized it will always have some factors there who are going to control it or who are going to have an impact on it uh, and the only thing that can happen or the only thing that can protect is uh, protect this is mass adoption so let's say today let's say uh, why there is a lot of volatility in the prices of major cryptocurrencies the major reason is its adoption how many people are adopting it and not even a 1% of the global population has yet adopted it now if you if you i'll give you this example as let's say tomorrow if in a, if our prime minister comes in and says we are not uh, going and using inr tomorrow from tomorrow we will use us dollars so now what happens with us dollars inr becomes useless but that's okay here what is happening is your us dollar uh, rises like anything because there is mm-hmm. a huge demand that is created now this is something now uh, a person who has huge chunks of us dollars which is the central government of uh, rbi has the biggest resource in india uh, of this particular us uh, mm-hmm. foreign reserves they 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 can come on and they they now they they become that way and they have that power so what happens is the only way to bring all these things to par or to dilute these powers is mass adoption now if everyone across the globe uh, uses us dollars today let's say now what will happen even if a country uh, tomorrow is adopting us dollars it will not have that big an impact so similarly okay. that whales might not have that kind of an impact if there is a huge mass adoption i mean that is the only way i see as a solution because now you do not have a kyc now you do not know who is doing what so you cannot go and put someone behind jail and you cannot stop them as well maybe some ip address blocking and all those stuff can happen right. but that is not feasible so this is the only way i, I see it can happen all right fantastic thank you so much ashwarya i think that pretty much covers it what i have taken away from this episode and please correct me if uh, i am wrong is one you're looking at uh, with decentralized finance you're looking at a system that essentially removes arbiters or removes a single point of human contact and instead says we trust the code we trust that if everybody has access to a certain degree of code and if everybody has a ledger this is a significantly better system than leaving in place uh, areas for human bias human error all of those things uh two is that while this is still not reached the mass adoption stage it feels like it could but as a result of that it's not something that you would encourage newbies to straight up get into because this is still a complex and dense world so you'd encourage them to go out and do a little learning on decentralized exchanges and things like uniswap and just how this ecosystem works before they get in there the third thing is that yes there are certain defi networks that have huge gas and transaction fees like the ethereum based ones uh, but there are others which as you mentioned using examples where you can carry out transactions for next to no fees and almost instantaneously uh the other thing i have learned is that uh, from a taxation and regulation perspective this is going to be giving sleepless nights to a lot of people at places like the rbi and the fed but they're going to have to figure it out at some point and money is never truly going to be decentralized or decolonized but this is a great start in the right direction i think and Those are all great things to leave an episode with. So thank you so much for being clear and lucid and all of those things about a concept that 
philosophically I've been struggling with for a while and I'm walking away feeling like I understand. Uh, that's it. This has been a show about crypto. You have been listening to Aishwarya Gupta. Please go follow him on YouTube. He's got a great channel where he explains things in lucidity and detail. And this has been a pleasure. Thank you so much. We will see you next week with more crypto concepts explained and understood, hopefully. Hey, everybody. It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. Are the great values of our constitution meant to be talked about by great men but not lived? On The Longest Constitution, Priya tells us about domestic violence laws in India and the many kinds of violence inflicted on women. Here's a fun conversation about online dating apps on Cyrus Says as Cyrus is joined by Snehal Kanor, co-founder and CEO of Truly Madly. On The Wire Talk, Siddharth is in discussion with Audrey Trishke, historian of South Asia and associate professor at Rutgers University. They discuss troll culture and the hate she received for her allegedly anti-Hindu views. On AudioGAN, Kedar and Abhineet get some design perspective from Navneet Nair, director of design at PhonePave. And on Tere Mere Raste, Kesho takes us to Hyderabad, a melting pot of cuisine and culture. Do follow us on social media. We're IVM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. And remember, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend that is the most helpful thing that you could do to help us out. And finally, this week, we'd like to thank our sponsors on the network, Cred, Bank of Baroda, Quarter, CoinSwitch, Kuber, and Intel V Pro. We really do appreciate the support. This is what makes it possible. Don't you think that if everyone around you is getting smart, you better be smarter? Hey there, I'm the traveling professor Siddharth Deshmukh and I'm back with season 2 of my podcast to make you smarter. Smarter with Sid. What's this season's focus about? Well, it's about 10 minute nuggets that will make you stand out at work. It's time to go from smart to smarter. Tune in every Tuesday and Thursday and become smarter with Sid.